Hello and welcome back to the Cheltenham 2021 head-to-head -head festival preview with myself and Dan overall. Dan, how are you doing? I'm not bad, mate. Thank you. It's been a, an interesting week of racing, I'd say, especially for our, or my, anti-post elections. So I'm sure we'll touch on that shortly. It was, it was going to be basically where we started this whole thing. But before we go any further, I, I would just like to open the floor for you to promote your blog that you've been doing, that you've been working on over the last uh, few months. If anyone doesn't know what you're doing, Dan, please feel free to tell them. Well, I mean, over last week, I even vaguely referenced it slightly. You shot me down and accused me of self-plugging it and, and all that. But now you've had a change of heart. So thank you very much. It was the writing. So, so yeah, it was the... so good. I just had to let you do this. Uh, well, people often come around once they either listen to my dulcet tones or hear my or read my beautiful words. So you wouldn't be the first. But for yeah, for those who don't know, I've been asked to do a series of Channel Festival previews for every single race. There'll be one posted every day through February. So we've already done the Arkle and the Ryanair. I'll be tweeting them on my page, which will be linked down below. And you can also find them on cheltenhamfestival.net, who have kindly offered me this role. So thanks to them. I hope you find them useful. Trust me, a lot of time has gone into these. I've been working on them for, I'd say, three weeks in the background, trying to get ahead of them because it's a lot of work to do. And uh, yeah, I hope you find them useful. And hopefully they help you find you some winners. Brilliant. Definitely do check that out. I'll, I'll be going through them all on the lead up to Cheltenham, trying to steal some information to help me make some better picks as well. Um, we'll start off with one of your selections that you made on this page. You stuck up Coco Beach for the Kim Muir. He ran in the Thaistis chase uh, this, this past week and has absolutely obliterated his handicap mark. Dan, tell us all about your feelings towards Coco Beach right now. I'm going through like the seven stages of grief, I think they call it. <laughs> like I've been through the anger, regret. At this point, I'm kind of at acceptance. I just, <laughs> you kind of eventually have to get over it. If it. I had mixed emotions going into the race, to be honest. I was glad to see him stepped up to three mile one, I think it was. It showed they were thinking along the lines, oh, I thought they might about stepping up in trip. But I had reservations over the fact that Jack Kennedy chose to ride him and they also put first time blinkers on him. Never normally a good sign if you want a horse to <laughs> preserve their mark. It kind of signaled a bit of intent. And at the start of the race, when they lined up, I was reasonably happy. He was at the back. Like, I thought, okay, quiet ride. Maybe testing if he stays. Might stay on into third or fourth. That didn't happen. He tanked his way <laughs> to the front, probably within the first three fences. Jumped superbly, like a fantastic round of jumping. And he absolutely bolted up, didn't he? I think he won by four lengths beating the other Kim Muir hot pot at the time from Wild Fred, but he was valued for way more than that. He won now for Mark 138. Now on Mark 150, obviously the ceiling for the Kim Muir is 145. So there goes that. I, I hope that some realise that across the board, Bookie seemed to cut him to like 10, 12 to 1. Uh, and hopefully some people cashed out knowing that there was no way in hell he was going to get in the Kim Muir after a performance like that. So it's frustrating, but very frustrating <laughs> but these things happen that's why there's uh it was such a big price to begin with there is these risks it's good to know that at least you were on, you were on the light on the right lines there uh if he hadn't have run there then he would have definitely bottled up in the kimia and we'd have had some very happy followers but on one nil to me i'd say in this um coco beach though to, to continue he's got an entry this weekend at musselburgh over four miles uh gordon elliott's got a handful of runners going over there this weekend it should be a very fruitful weekend for him uh coco beach's festival targets from now where, where would you be sending him or do you know where they're going to be sending him i'd say those elliott runners have pretty much solely been entered just to assess where their marks are going to be i think the boss's oscar has entered Rivier de Tell, I mentioned the other week, has one to look out for. She got a mark of 133. So I think they're just trying to find out where the British handicapper sees them. Um, as for Coco Beach, I think their plan is National Hunt Chase now. On a mark of 150 in a, a decent renewal or subpar one, he'd have a, a leading chance. But that's not what we've got this year. It's a, a really hot race. But he'd still have each way claims. He's going the right way. He jumps really nicely and he's got some experience after competing in that Fiestas. So I'd be keen on his each way chances. And I think the long-term target this season is the Irish national. He's only a six year old. So potentially Aintree could be on the cards in coming years. Like he's taking a similar route to Tiger roll in the sense he was a decent juvenile and uh, flourished over fences. So 
maybe he can replicate that. That would be some sort of a, some dream, really, wouldn't it? Uh, we'll talk about your other selection. This one, uh, more happier memories, I'm sure. A clap de rear. And so you put him up on the first week of this podcast at uh, 33 to 1. He drifted out to 40 to 1 pretty much as soon as we put the video out. Uh, and now he's come tumbling back into 14 to 1 as his best price. He's a really likable horse. He put in a fantastic round of jumping on just his second start of offences. Go on, do some bragging. <laughs> I've earned it, I think, after suffering through Coco Beach's explanation. Yeah, it was it was a horribly likable performance. Again, I think for people who watched his first start of offences, they'd probably almost watch the identical race again. Very professional right in front, jumped superbly. Once they came, came to him as well, what I like about him is once horses come to him, he doesn't just kind of give in. He's very, very professional and races like a horse who's had 40 starts overall, not just four. And once Ascaria 10 kind of came to him on that second last, he had another superb jump and pulled away. And although he only beat that rival by about a length and a half, I think he probably was a bit more value for that. Rachel Batmore kind of, kind of nursed him along until the last before asking for his full effort. And yeah, he's, he's a live one in the RSA now. Like I think he's going to, if he goes there, which Henry de Bromad seemed quite sure about going, he's going to go from the front presumably. And his jumping is going to hold him in good stead there. We still really don't know where this horse's ceiling is. He could be pretty much anything, but he's going to go out in front and he's going to make it a test for his rivals. Like the likes of Big Breakaway are not going to like his presence in this race because he's not going to get away with any mistakes now that he's in the race. It's going to be a really interesting one. Uh, the the staying novice chasing is uh, are looking really good. I don't know whether the RSA is going to cut up if we're going to have a really strong RSA or a really strong national hunt chase. It's, it's going to be one or the other, but the, the divisions look really strong. It's going to be interesting to see how he goes and, and well done on a fantastic ticket, I suppose. I'm glad at least I'm on it. Um, God, which... The resentment in that sentence. Like, did you see <laughs> your face? It was said with such hatred. But, yeah, oh, thanks, I, know, mate. I know I've now <laughs> got to go and get like a, a big price winner to match this possible 33 to one shot. So it's definitely skewing my vision. You knew uh, the risk of this when you invited me on, mate. Yeah, 50 pounds. <laughs> you knew the risk. 50 pounds on the line. What was I thinking? <laughs> um, <laughs> all right. Let's move on to uh, to one other runner from this past weekend, and that'll be Shishkin. A really, really good performance. There's no denying it. Uh, are, are you sweet on Shishkin's chances? Is it just a walk in the park for him now, or would you be looking to take him on in the Arkle? I, I wouldn't be looking to lay him at the price. I mean, he looks fantastic, doesn't he? I think even last time out, maybe he looked briefly as if he wasn't going as sweetly as you'd like, such a short price favourite. Maybe maybe his jumping was a bit left at times, but he just finds the other gear. He's almost more reminiscent of Altior in that sense, that he may look briefly in trouble, but he just finds and finds. And what he does, considering the times he's produced, despite being on the bridle half the time, is quite magnificent, really. I mean, if I was going to have a bet in the Arkle now, I mean, his price is what it is. He'd be looking to double or treble him up with something. But I think... And Ergamine is still a decent each way play on him. I think he's about five to one. It's hard to see him. Obviously, we've got the Irish Arkle coming up, but he looks very good. It's hard to see him realistically finishing out the frame. So I'd be more inclined to side with him at the prices, but it's hard not to be excited by Shishkin. He's uh, it's, it's incredible how Nicky Anderson's just had this generation after generation of top two mile chase talent. It's uh, really is something. Just coming in on a conveyor belt at the moment, really, aren't they? Um, I was actually watching that Shishkin run and I was quite worried the whole way around. He was, he was jumping out to his left and I, I sort of worried that he'd jump into the path of another horse and and, and, and almost take a fall is what my, my main worry was. Also, he looked to get quite close to his fences. But when I went back and watched the race again and also went back to watch his other races, that is just the way he jumps. And it's just quite exceptional to see, really. So I, there was never really a worry. I should never really have been worried. But uh, yeah, I, I was looking at the um, at the at the way he races. A strong staying two miler is what he is, which is exactly the same as Altura, as you sort of alluded to there. I think that we're going to get a really strong um, strong pace in the Arkle this coming year with all mankind and Anergamine both likely to come from the front. I think the further they go, the better Shishkin's going to get. And I can actually see him breezing past him. I wouldn't be looking to have a bet in the Arkle now. The price has completely vanished on Shishkin. I wouldn't really want to be taking him on either. Um, I take I take what you say about Anergamine, but I just feel it could be a real burn-up and we could see him start faltering late on. But we'll learn a little bit more about him in the Irish Arkle. Uh, talking about the Irish Arkle, we'll uh, discuss a couple of our fancies for the Dublin Racing Festival. 
I'll start with you if you want to go for one of your ones from the Dublin Racing Festival this weekend that you want to keep an eye on. Yeah, I'll, I'll mention one I've put up on this page, actually. Holy Macaponi, as discussed in that analysis I gave, that he's going to go for the two more six uh, at Leopardstown on the Saturday, I believe, the first race. Now, that race is a really good one. Like It's got Statler in there, I think. Gillard de Manil, who he beat on debut, is lining up. It's going to be a really, really big test. I think Gentleman's Game, that Mouse Morris horse who bolted up previously as well. It's going to be a tough one, but I really do have faith in Henry de Bromhead's ability to bring these horses back. And Holy Macaponi's form just looks so solid. When Gillard de Manil won next time out, the horse that was in second to him bolted up, I think, at the weekend as well. So like you've got those residual form lines kind of sticking out as well. If he can bounce back to that and just add on a bit more, as these horses should do with considering they're young, I still make him a massive player in the Albert Bartlett. He needs to prove it now. He's got something to prove, but I think he might have been trimmed into 20 to 1 now. I think a few, a bit of support came in for him in recent weeks. But yeah, he's a live one. I'm looking forward to seeing him and I hope he bounces back. I'll apologise to you because I did tell you to pick one from the Dublin Racing Festival, but I found one from there and also found one uh, for the Silly Isles, uh, which is going to be at Sandown this weekend. And now you put this horse on the radar for me, and that's Hitman. Um, he was going to be my selection for the Arkle, but for this reason that he's being stepped up in trip and the talks of him possibly missing Cheltenham uh, it led me to obviously not put him up. He's only had two runs of offences, and his form behind all mankind obviously looks really strong. They're stepping up in trip, and if that has the desired effect, I think that we could see a really, really impressive performance. I'll thank you for putting him on my radar, Dan. Uh, <laughs> last year for the Boodles, unfortunately, he didn't turn up that day. But I think I think you've plucked out a really nice horse here, and his jumping is really impressive. That Silly Isles does look, uh, as you well, as like your race. The Silly Isles does look really strong this year. Um, it'll be a very interesting race. But if they do go and miss Cheltenham, there's no reason why they'll be holding anything back with him at all. So, yeah, very excited to see him. Who's your other pick going to be? Uh, I've got a couple. I mean, I haven't gone through the cards in massive detail, but these are a couple I've had my eye on or seem like intriguing entries. Uh, one is Blue Zari, who is out for the first time this season in, I think he's declared for the two-mile handicap at the Dublin Racing Festival for Mark 140. Obviously, his form in the champion bumper behind Devoy Lan looks <laughs> ridiculous now. Abracadabra is back in form as well. It looks exceptional. And he made a nice start to life over hurdles. I think the boss's Oscar was second. I think it was uh, Ashdale Bob back in fourth. So that form has been franked again and again. But he just went off the boil towards the back end of last year. And we haven't seen him since. So it'll be interesting to see how he gets on. <laughs> William Bullins, JP, maybe ends up in a county hurdle. And you'd want to see how he runs this time. I'm not sure what price he is for the county or if he even go to Cheltenham. But yeah, he's an interesting one if he can bounce back. And the other horse who's an interesting one, I think he's got a couple of entries at Leopardstown, is Champagne Gold for Henry de Bromhead. Now, I'm not sure where he'll run. I think he's in a grade one of his hurdle and I think he's in the handicap as well. But he's been progressing quite nicely. He's gone under the radar a bit. I'm not sure where he'll eventually turn up in the long run. But he's a nice horse in the making, I think. He's the same owners as Merlerindo, same connections, obviously. And I'd be interested in him as a long-term prospect. Maybe even he could even turn into like a Martin Pipe horse. I didn't think he was necessarily lacking stamina over two and a half last time out. So he's another one just to see where he goes and how he gets on. So you've you stuck. Well, you've spoke about Blue Sari. He's going to be going for the for the Labrooks hurdle, I believe. Uh, I've got another one for that race as well. Uh, this is Advanced Virgo for Charles Burns. Now Charles Burns won this race the past three years. In 2018, he won with Off You Go, rated 123. In 2019, he won with the same horse of 143. And then last year, he won with Those Days Are Gone of 126. I was looking back, horses who are right down the bottom of the weights tend to actually do really well. And obviously, as you see, Charles Burns does target this race. Now, as Vance Virgo is only rated 131, and he won the same race at Fairy House that Off You Go did before his second win in the race. I think he's about 10 to 1 second favourite at the moment. But uh, I think Charles Burns will be looking to pick up a nice pop before his possible suspension comes in. So, a popular um, winner he'd be, eh? Yeah, it wouldn't go down for Thank God there's no time. crowds there. <laughs> <laughs> you might see great. like the first egging on a race course of a trainer <laughs> if he gets into the winner's enclosure. Jeez, we can only hope. Well, if you back him, I, I, I'm hopeful for you, but we can only hope that he doesn't land any big prize before his suspension. My God, that would be a, a controversial one, I think. 
no crowds, but Ruby Walsh is launching Exit Him. That would be some TV that. I'd pay to see that. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right. So that's going to wrap up what we've done there. We're just going to get into some selections now. Dan, I, I went last week, so you can go first this week. Take it away. Yeah, I'm going to target the same race you did last week as well in the Ultima. I can't go back to the Kim Yor just yet. The scars are too raw to go back in. Although I think it's worth saying Ascaria 10 has been smashed in for that race and has a great chance. And maybe a bigger price, schoolboy hours, wants to keep an eye on for that. But back to the Ultima, a, a few trends just to note, I think always useful in these kind of big handicaps. So 10 of the last 12 winners were either novices or second season chasers. The Irish, surprisingly, they don't have many races, but they have a poor record in this one. Not for 26 since 2006. Seven of the eight last eight winners uh, ran at a previous festival. And interestingly, four of the last seven ran in the Labrooks or the Hennessy, as you affectionately call it, earlier in the season. So that's been a good pointer. And the horse that fits all those trends is I Right. Now, he's a horse we discussed quite a lot before, I think, for the for the Labrooks. And mm-hmm. we were all quite sweet when he was a horse, but he had something to prove. And uh, he's been a bit of a re- revelation this season, hasn't he, really? He was in last year's RSA. He finished a fair fifth that day. And he still had a, ch- a chance free out, despite making three horrific errors, which you'll forgive him, really, considering he went to Cheltenham last year on the back of only one complete start over fences, and that was in a two-runner race. So they really threw him in the deep end, and he ran with plenty of credit. And he's just been really consistent this season. He's, he's third in the Charlie Hall behind surname Vindication, kind of put him on the map as a, as a chaser to note. And then he was second in, in the Labrador behind Clough Cap, who had literally everything fall his way that day. He had, he had the ground, great ride, first time cheek pieces. It was perfect for him. But again, I write was admirable in defeat. And I had a few doubts about him that day about whether he'd be able to jump in a bigger field like he did, he did in Charlie Hall, but he had an easy lead that day. And he kind of put those concerns to bed fairly quickly. He was an impressive performance. He didn't win, but there was a lot to like about it. And then we saw him finish a good second in the Skybet Chase just this weekend at Doncaster, only to be caught late on by taking risks, who as a former Scottish national winner is a dour stayer. And there was no shame in that defeat, really. The third horse, Captain Nord, was quite widely touted, given his form with Royal Pagai, and they pulled quite nicely clear. So it was a good performance, and uh, Callum Bewley did drop his whip on the approach to two out, and that eventually, in the game of fine margins, that might have made all the difference. It was, uh, nevertheless, it was a really impressive run again, and he's just such a likeable horse. So I think that race is good form. It was five seconds quicker than the three-mile handicap chase, the other three-mile handicap chase on the same card. And he's gone up three pounds now to mark 154. But that isn't ideal, obviously. We kind of want these horses protected for their marks. And he's kind of getting to maybe his ceiling. But he keeps progressing. He's only had seven runs over fences still. And there's every reason to think he might have won that Doncaster race had the jockey kept his whip or if maybe the ground was a bit better for him because that ended up being quite testing. I don't think he was in love with that. And his preparation was far from ideal. I think Harriet Graham mentioned her ground really had been frozen for most of that time and that the running in an all-weathers bumper uh, 10 days before, which isn't exactly what you want going into a, a big race like that. So I think there are reasons to mark that run up even more and maybe a three pound rise hasn't capped him just yet. So it's worth noting as well, six of the last nine winners of the Ultima carried more than 11 stone. In Tempo 2 won his second Ultima of 155 recently. The Wear the Bear won 151. And you had three of last year's front four running from marks in the high 140s to the 150s. So quality can come to the fore in this race. And as opposed to maybe the likes of the Kim Muir, where you're looking at plot horses or mark horses being protected, the Ultima generally rewards horses who have been in good form. So it's, I think, 24 of the last 31 winners of the Ultima were either first or second in either of their last two starts. I think that's a fantastic stat from Gold Stats, so it's a great website for trends if you're looking for that. And in my mind, I write is absolutely tailor-made for this race. He fits the profile almost to a T. He has Cheltenham form. He's progressive. And he's a prominent racer as well. He's going to be up there with the pace. And I think that's crucial in this race. On that course, with the chaos can often ensue in, uh, behind. I think you really want to be up with the pace throughout. And it proved so last year. Only Discarama really could ch- even threaten to challenge from off the pace. It would be a concern now that connections keep talking about the Scottish National but at this stage because he's such almost a nearly horse I think they'd be happy to win anything 
And the autumn is a decent stepping stone to the Scottish National anyway in terms of timings. I think there's 45 days between Doncaster and the Ultima, and there'd be 32 days between the Ultima and the Scottish National. So it seems like a logical next race for him. And Harriet Graham doesn't exactly strike me as a trainer who's going to be plotting horses or not putting him there to run his race if he does indeed go. And in general, the Ultima to me is, uh, I just am very uninspired by those towards the head of the market other than him. The conditional, he's got a fair shout, but connections seem to be targeting the Gold Cup for him. I think the owner is getting on in years and he wants a runner in the big race. And, and well, who can blame him? Happy Go Lucky is another one, but he's going to the National Hunt Chase. And one for the team is the other one who's a novice, but he lacks Shelton form. And although good ground he'll probably improve for if he runs here, he was very disappointing in that race that I write was second in. So with that in mind, I, I think the 25 to one, if I write runs here, I can't see him out the first four, to be honest. I think he's absolutely perfect for this race. Eric Graham even said before the Skybet chase that she just wishes the race was over a couple of furlongs further and on quicker ground. Well, you're going to pretty much get that in the Ultima. <laughs> That's exactly what you're going to get. I just really hope he goes there. It's not a foregone conclusion, but they've been speaking about it. They're clearly not afraid to run at Cheltenham as they did last year with so little experience. And for me, there's he's just such a likable horse. And if he does run, I can see him going off towards the head of the market and he'll place at worst, surely, on, on the form we know. He's just such a, a great horse for connections. It'd be a very likable winner, wouldn't it? We had Harriet Graham on, uh, on on this channel right at the start of the season, as you say, for that Ladbrokes we spoke to her, and she was very upbeat, and she just wanted a she just wanted Saturday runners. That's that's what she wanted. She just wanted a, somewhat, a horse to run in the big races, and and I'll tell you what, I write has probably gone above and beyond all of her expectations. Um, I really I really like the angle, really like the horse, as you say, very admirable. I I've, I'd worry about him going that just to, just to go and win the race. Uh, as he as he's just as you say, seems to be that nearly horse, but uh, but yeah, I wouldn't begrudge seeing I right win on the big day. Uh, my, my selection is going to be coming from the Triumph Hurdle. Um, there's one right at the top of the market uh, who has uh, who came with a very tall reputation this year, and, and that's Quilixios around twelve to one. Now we set to run this weekend at the Dublin Racing Festival. He's currently a short price favourite for the race. Now. One thing I'd like to mention is where he is in the market in comparison to um, French Seal. So for this weekend, you've got Quilixos as a short price favourite, about 11 to 8. And then French Seal as 2 to 1 second favourite. But then when, when you look at the Triumph hurdle, you've got Quilixos at, at 12 to 1 and French Seal at around 6 or 7 to 1. Now, so I think there's a bit, of a, a bit of a price discrepancy here. So I'd definitely be thinking this is a value play. Quilixos hasn't really had to go and beat anything as of yet but he's won with his head in his chest he won by like 20 lengths and 14 lengths and i look alongside him and zana here and i and i don't think that they can separate them i think they see them as equals and there's nothing that i can see so far to say opposite we'll be getting a direct form line after this uh, after this weekend with bustleton uh, he finished four lengths behind zana here the last day uh, and, and his looks set to run this weekend so that's going to give us a that's going to give us a clue i think colixios is a really good each way bet i uh, would rather be back in him each way now in the hopes that he's a lot shorter come the end of this weekend than back in someone like Santa here who i still think has a fair bit to prove at 11 to 4. i know i know you haven't looked too much at the triumph hurdle but what's what's your thoughts on the triumph hurdle yeah, it's one of those races I, I tend to leave till later on, just because you sometimes get one spring out of nowhere late that really make a mess of the market. And also you just see such varying rates of improvement across them. Like the form gets reversed all the time in early on in the season. It's just kind of one that's hard to predict. But he's, he's a lovely horse. He looks fantastic. As you say, Zana here is looked very, very impressive in what he's done so far. It's interesting they don't run him at the Dublin Racing Festival. Maybe they think he's had the experience now. And they'll, I'll put, give it into Calixios now, see how he gets on. And that's a yard that know where the juveniles are at, surely. I mean, they've got so many good ones. I mentioned Riviera de Tell previously. There's one to keep an eye on, maybe in the in the uh, Fred Winter. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I wouldn't begrudge you. Obviously, you've got a race coming up where you're going to know where you stand pretty much, aren't you? Fairly, sh sh fairly soon after. So you're not going to be fretting about where he runs or what happens <laughs> your fate is pretty much known in the in the next few days and it could be a, a big weekend for you if that Cotswold chase gets rearranged on the Saturday as well so you love St Calvados and Calixios run uh, so it'll be a 
D-Day a, for you. A very similar play to Defi de Soy. I just hope this one comes off a little bit. <laughs> Well, Calixios has far less to prove than Deffy does. Jeez. <laughs> yes, no, most definitely. Well, that's going to wrap up uh, episode five, I believe, of these anti-post bets. We will, uh, we'll go through our full book at the end of the Dublin Racing Festival. So next week, we'll start off by going through our runners, how we're going and, and where we're looking at. Um, but other than that, we hope you enjoy what's going to be a fantastic weekend of racing, not only over in Ireland, but don't forget that Silly Arts, which looks an absolute cracker. Anyway, we hope you enjoyed the video and we'll catch you next week.